The war had gone badly for Yamamoto after Pearl Harbor when the losses were all added up. The Battle of the Coral Sea on May 7th, 8, the first naval engagement to be fought by forces that never came in sight of one another and traded blows only by air was certainly not a clear victory. His biggest loss was, of course, the Battle of Midway. On August 8th, 9, 1942, his forces barely eked out a victory in the Battle of Savo Island, and he could certainly claim no great honours for the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, which began on March 2nd, 1943, when a B-24 piloted by Lieutenant Walter Higgins discovered a convoy of 14 ships heading for Ley, New Guinea. This force was soon joined by eight more for a total of 12 troop transports and 10 cruisers and destroyers. On the first day of the action, March 4th, 1943, American planes destroyed eight troop transports with more than 5,000 troops on board destined for New Guinea from Rabaul on New Britain Island. Yamamoto's force also lost four of eight destroyers. Sixteen Army Air Force P-30ATS engaged the defending Zeros at altitude while Boeing B-17S level bombed and North American B-25S and Douglas A-20S used new low-level skip bombing techniques to hammer the slow-moving ships below. By late afternoon of the second day, the Japanese had 83 planes destroyed or damaged. The Air Force lost one B-17 and three P-38S in combat. With the opposing planes out of the air, the Americans concentrated on the remaining ships. As darkness fell on March 4th, not a single Japanese craft of the original 22 was still afloat. The US Air Force had lost 13 men, the enemy approximately 12,700. Emperor Hirohito's displeasure at this latest loss was quickly relayed to Yamamoto, now based at the Great Fleet Base on Truk Atoll in the Caroline Islands. Knowing full well that the tide was turning badly against his forces, as he had predicted it would before the war began, he made a flight to Rabaul on April 3rd to bolster morale and make plans to retake the initiative in the air. On April 7th, under the codename Operation Waigo, he launched his pilots on a series of 100 to 200 plane raids against Guadalcanal and American bases in New Guinea. On four separate days, April 7th, 11, 12 and 14, a total of 486 Japanese fighters, 114 carrier-based bombers, and 80 land-based attack planes took part in missions against American forces. Each time aircraft took off from Rabaul, Yamamoto stood beside the runway dressed in dress whites and waved his cap in farewell. The Japanese claimed that 134 American planes were shot down during those four days. The Americans reported only 25 lost. The Japanese reported that only 42 of their own planes were destroyed in combat, whereas American pilots claimed they had bagged 51 of the enemy. Late in the day of April 13th, when the last Japanese stragglers limped in, the message was sent from Rabaul by Vice Admiral Tomoshiga Samajima, the commander of the 8th Air Fleet, announcing Yamamoto's intention to visit the forward bases at Bougainville on the 18th. On the 17th, Yamamoto had lunch with Lieutenant General. Hitoshi Imamura, commander of the ground forces at Rabaul. Imamura, who had barely escaped death in the air two mouths earlier on a similar flight to Bum on the southern tip of Bougainville, advised Yamamoto not to go. Rear Admiral Takaji Joshima, a long-time friend of Yamamoto's, flew in to plead with his superior not to expose himself to a possible aerial ambush. He called the trip madness and an open invitation to the enemy because of the proximity to American airbases. Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa, Commander-in-Chief of the Third Fleet, also objected and offered to send a great number of planes to accompany Yamamoto. Yamamoto was grateful for this expression of concern, but would not change his plans. If the weather was good, he would go. Despite glowing reports of the great losses to the Americans and minor losses to his own forces, he realised the power of the Americans to stop his forces was growing stronger each day. His resources were spread too thin. He cancelled Operation Wango, recognising that he could not sustain the effort any longer. He had lost many experienced pilots in the Battle of Midway and subsequent engagements. The replacement pilots were inexperienced and their morale was sagging. He felt it was his duty to visit the units at Balal, Buin and Shortland Island and encourage them to greater valour in the name of the Emperor. 
A personal appearance was necessary to prove to his men that he had confidence in the ultimate outcome. Yamamoto was a striking figure in his white uniform. He stood out in sharp contrast to the dark green service uniforms worn by his men in combat. However, on April 18th, he chose not to wear the white uniform and emerged from his quarters wearing the green. Accompanied by Chief of Staff Matome Ugaki, he went by staff car to the airfield on the east side of Rabaul, where two Mitsubishi G-4M land-based attack planes of the 705th Naval Air Squadron, Kokutai, were waiting. Yamamoto boarded the first plane, no, 323, with the fleet medical officer, Rear Admiral Rokuro Takada, Commander, Kurio Toibana, a staff officer, and Commander, Nonoru Fukusaki, an aide. Fleet Warrant Officer Takeo Kotani was the pilot, Chief Flight Seaman Akiharu Osaki, co-pilot. There were five other crewmen aboard. Ugaki boarded the second plane, no, 326, with Captain Motoharu Kitamura, Chief Paymaster, Commander, Rinji Tomono, the Fleet Weather Officer, Commander, Kaoru Imanaka, Communications Staff Officer, and Commander, Suteji Muroi, a Navy Air Force Staff Officer, Flight Petty Officer Hiroshi Hayashi was the pilot, Chief Flight Seaman Fumikatsu Fujimoto was co-pilot. There were also five air crewmen aboard NUM 326. The two Mitsubishi G-4M attack planes called Flying Cigars by the Japanese and Bettys by the Americans took off precisely at 6 a.m., immediately following were the six Model 32 Zeros of the 204th Naval Air Squadron, led by First Lieutenant Morisaki. The Zeros immediately split up into two Vs of three planes each and took position on each side of the two bombers. The weather was clear, an excellent day for flying. The bombers climbed to 6,500 feet, the fighters slightly higher. After an hour and a half of uneventful flight, Kotani passed a note to Yamamoto seated behind him. Expect to arrive at Balal at 7.45. In the other bomber, Ugaki was dozing. Hayashi noticed that his plane was vibrating slightly because an antenna pole had come loose and was shaking in the wind stream. He throttled back, and Numtran 326 began to lag slightly behind Yamamoto's plane. The gap widened to about two and a half miles, according to Ugaki's estimate. When the engines changed their sound, Ugaki awoke, suddenly sensing that something was wrong. He recalled, Suddenly Hayashi at the controls saw a red tracer flash past. Tanimoto, an observer crew member, jabbed Hayashi on the shoulder and shouted, Enemy aircraft! Startled, Hayashi glanced up and saw a P-38 flash by overhead. He jammed the throttles to the stops, pushed the control wheel forward, kicked right rudder, and headed toward the sea. The lead bomber, still flying about two and a half miles to the right, had also nosed down toward the jungle treetops. It slowed down noticeably and began to spurt black smoke and flames. Ugaki shouted to the pilot Hayashi, Follow plane number one! Follow plane number one! Hayashi ignored Ugaki's plea. He took violent evasive action and continued downward, headed out to sea. The lead plane could no longer be seen. A tall column of black smoke began to rise lazily out of the jungle. Hayashi, now over the ocean, was being pursued by a P-38. He was skimming about 100 feet above the wave tops when he suddenly lost control. Number 326 plunged into the water off Moiler Point at the southwestern extremity of Bougainville Island. Warrant officer Kenji Yanagiya, pilot of one of the six Zeros assigned to accompany the two bombers, was honoured to be selected to fly cover for the famous admiral. He had been flying combat in the theatre since the previous October, and had about 100 missions in his logbook. His plane and the other Zeros were equipped with a 20mm cannon and 7mm machine guns. Like the other Zeros, his had no radio because the pilots had elected to take them out to lighten the aircraft. There was no way they could communicate with the bombers except by hand signals or wing-wagging. The pilots were not briefed to expect any interception from American fighters. It was to be a routine escort flight, and the Zeros were to fly about 1,500 feet above and behind the two Bettys to the destination. Yanagiya's element of three Zeros was to the right of the bombers. His flight leader belatedly saw the P-38s attacking and immediately dove toward them. They made one pass at a P-38 and zoomed upward to try again. As he climbed, 
Yanagiya saw Yamamoto's bomber smoking and heading for the jungle. The other was heading for the ocean. Yanagiya believed that he and the other Zero pilots were delayed in seeing the Americans begin their attack because they were accustomed to looking skyward. They did not think the P-38s would be climbing from a lower altitude. Aircraft flying over the jungle were harder to spot from above. Yanagiya was separated from his element and flew toward Shortland Island. He stated he saw a P-38 in level flight at about 9,000 feet and attacked. The P-38 did not burn but white vapour, probably gasoline, poured out as his bullets scored. Yanagiya zoomed past the P-38 and did not see it go down. He did not make a second attack and would not say that he deserved credit for an elimination. Yanagiya did not know until 1988 that one P-38, piloted by Lieutenant Ray Hine, did not return to Guadalcanal. Yanagiya turned back toward Buin and made a pass over the field, wagging his wings. He fired a few bursts from his guns to signal the encounter to ground personnel. Apparently they already knew he was the last to land. Of the six zeros, one made an emergency landing at Shortland Island, its difficulty, whether from battle damage or aircraft malfunction, has never been ascertained. Yanagiya stated in a 1988 interview that not only were none of the six Zeros shot down, but none of the five that landed at Buin had any combat damage. He made no statement about the sixth Zero that landed at Shortland. The flight leader made his report to the airbase commander at Buin and the five Zeros, and presumably the one at Shortland were ordered to return to Rabaul about two hours later. The Zero pilots reported three P-38S were shot down. However, no Japanese pilot confirmed the termination of any other pilot. Yanagiya recalled that the Buin airfield had always been noted for the great clouds of dust that swirled around when aircraft took off and landed. In order to get ready for the expected arrival of the commander-in-chief, the Buin airfield commander had ordered all hands to participate in a massive clean-up of the runway. Officers and men worked all night. When the Zeros came in to land, the pilots were surprised to see the base's entire garrison standing at attention in spotless dress uniforms along the freshly cleaned runway. Replying to questions at the Yamamoto retrospective in 1988, Yanagiya said he was convinced that the Americans knew who was flying in the lead plane and that the attack was deliberate, not an accident. He does not believe any of the Zeros on the ground at Kahili got airborne, However, there is one undocumented report by an American writer that about 30 fighters had departed from Kahili to search for the attacking Americans but were too late. This was later confirmed by Japanese historians. Unknown to the Americans until many years after the war, there were three survivors of Numtoa 326, the second attack bomber containing staff members after it smashed into the sea off Moila Point, Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki, Chief of Staff of the Combined Fleet, Petty Officer Hiroshi Hayashi, Chief Pilot, and Rear Admiral Motoharu Kitamura, Chief Paymaster, Combined Fleet. Ugaki kept a diary, later published in Japan under the title Sensoroku, in which he recorded his traumatic experience that day. His entry for April 18th, written several months later, was extensive, but because Ugaki was still hurting badly when he wrote it, his account is inaccurate and exaggerated. As soon as I entered the second bomber, both aircraft began their takeoff runs down the field. The lead bomber took to the air first. As our planes passed over the volcano at the bay's end, we slid into formation and took a southeast course. Clouds were intermittent, and with excellent visibility, flying conditions were good. I could see our escort fighters weaving in their protective pattern. Three fighters flew off to our far left. Three remained high above and behind us, and three others making nine in all, cruised to the right. Our bombers flew a tight formation, their wings almost touching, and my plane remained slightly behind and to the left of the lead ship. We flew at approximately 5,000 feet. We could clearly see the Admiral in the pilot seat of the other bomber and the passengers moving within the airplane. We reached the west side of Bougainville Island, flying at 2,200 feet directly over the jungle. A crew member handed me a note reading, our time of arrival at Balail is 7.40 hours. I remember looking at my wristwatch and noting that the time was exactly 7.30. In 15 minutes we would arrive at our first stop. Without warning, the motors roared and the bomber plunged toward the jungle, close behind the lead airplane, levelling off at less than 200 feet. 
Nobody knew what had happened, and we scanned the sky anxiously for the enemy fighter planes we felt certain were diving to the attack. The crew chief, a flight warrant officer, answered our queries from his position in the narrow aisle. It looks as if we made a mistake, sir. We shouldn't have dived. He certainly was right, for our pilots should never have left our original altitude. Our fighter planes had sighted a group of at least 24 enemy planes approaching from the south. They began to dive toward the bombers to warn them of the approaching enemy planes. Simultaneously, however, our bomber pilots also sighted the enemy force and, without orders, raced for low altitude. Not until we had levelled off did our crewmen take their battle positions. Screaming wind and noise assailed our ears as the men unlimbered the machine guns. Even as we pulled out above the jungle, our escort fighters turned into the attacking planes, now identifiable as the big Lockheed P-38ES. The numerically superior enemy force broke through the Zeros and plunged after our two bombers. My own plane swung sharply into a 90-degree turn. I watched the crew chief lean forward and tap the pilot on the shoulder, warning him that the enemy fighters were fast closing in. Our plane separated from the lead bomber. For a few moments I lost sight of Yamamoto's plane and finally located the Betty far to the right. I was horrified to see the airplane flying slowly just above the jungle, headed to the south, with bright orange flames rapidly enveloping the wings and fuselage. About four miles away from us, the bomber trailed thick black smoke, dropping lower and lower. Sudden fear for the Admiral's life gripped me. I tried to call to Commander Muroy, standing immediately behind me, but could not speak. I grasped him by the shoulder and pulled him to the window, pointing to the Admiral's burning plane. I caught a last glimpse myself, an eternal farewell to this beloved officer, before our plane swung sharply over in a steep turn. Tracers flashed by our wings, and the pilot desperately manoeuvred to evade the pursuing fighter plane. I waited impatiently for the airplane to return to horizontal position, so that I could observe the Admiral's bomber. Although I hoped for the best, I knew only too well what the fate of the airplane would be. Yamamoto's plane was no longer in sight. Black smoke boiled from the dense jungle into the air. Alas, it was hopeless now. Even as I stared at the funeral pyre of the crashed bomber, our own plane straightened out from its frantic manoeuvring and at full speed raced toward Moila Point. Shortly we were over the open sea. We noticed the concentration of dogfighting planes in the area where Yamamoto's bomber had plunged into the jungle. Other fighters were separating from the group and turning toward us now. I stared hopelessly as a silver H-shaped P-38 half-rolled in a screaming zoom, then turned steeply and closed rapidly toward our plane. Our gunners were firing desperately at the big enemy fighter, but to no avail. The bomber's 7.7mm machine guns could not reach the approaching P-38. Taking advantage of his superior speed, the enemy pilot closed in rapidly and, still beyond the range of our defensive guns, opened fire. I watched the P-38's nose seem to burst into twinkling flame, and suddenly the bomber shook from the impact of the enemy's machine gun bullets and cannon shells. The P-38 pilot was an excellent gunner, for his first fusillade of bullets and shells crashed into the right side of the airplane, then into the left. The drumming sounds vibrated through the airplane which rocked from the impact of the enemy fire. We knew we were now completely helpless, and waited for our end to come. The P-38 hung grimly to our tail, pouring in his deadly fire. One by one our answering machine guns fell silent. Abruptly our crew chief, who had been shouting orders to his men, fell from our view. Several of the crew were already dead, as the bullets screamed through the airplane. Commander Muroy sprawled over the chair and table in the fuselage compartment, his hands thrown out before him, his head rolling lifelessly back and forth as the plane shuddered. Another cannon shell suddenly tore open the right wing. The chief pilot, directly in front of me, pushed the control column forward. Our only chance of survival was to make a crash landing in the sea. I did not realise it at the time, but a Zero pilot above us in the futile attack against the grimly pursuing P-38 reported heavy smoke pouring from our bomber. Almost into the water, the pilot pulled back on the controls to bring the airplane out of the dive, but he could no longer control the aircraft. Enemy bullets had shattered the cables. Desperately, the pilot terminated our power, but again it was too late. At full speed, the bomber smashed into the water. 
The left wing crumpled and the plane rolled sharply over to the left. We prepared for an emergency landing. I do not recall being injured in the crash. Apparently the shock of the planes meeting the water at such high speed numbed my senses, for when I was hurled into the aisle from my seat my body was bruised and cut. The impact of the crash momentarily stunned me and everything turned black. I felt the crushing force of salt water pouring into the fuselage and almost immediately we were below the surface. I was completely helpless. Convinced this was my end, I said a requiem to myself. Naturally, it was difficult to remember coherently everything which happened in those incredible moments, but I vaguely recall that I felt as if life had come to its end. I could not bring myself to move and could only lie perfectly still. I do not believe I was actually knocked unconscious. I did not swallow any seawater. Ugaki's diary described what the search parties had found at the lead bomber's crash site and noted that, even in death, dignity did not leave the great naval officer. To us, Admiral Yamamoto virtually was a god. Ugaki then related what he learned later. As to the wreckage of my own plane, divers went to 67 feet below the water's surface, but found only the wheels, engine, propellers, machine guns, and one officer's sword. The following day, the bodies of two crewmen were washed up on shore. Between Ugaki's diary entry for April 18th and later testimony by the pilot Hayashi, Yamamoto biographer Agawa reconstructed what he believed happened. Following is a paraphrased version. The plane was burning when it struck the water. Ugaki and Hayashi were thrown out of the plane through the canopy over the cockpit. Ugaki and Hayashi began swimming to shore and were fired on by army lookouts stationed along the coast. Hayashi shouted and the firing stopped. The two were hauled ashore and given first aid. Ugaki was seriously injured, but Hayashi had only a few bruises and a cut on his mouth. Kitamura, meanwhile, was also injured and was dazedly swimming alone. He was rescued by a Navy seaplane and brought ashore. He had a hole in his throat and could not speak. Hayashi was flown out next day to Rabaul and promptly isolated in the hospital. He was questioned and cautioned by intelligence officers not to tell what had happened. He returned to flying two months later. Ugaki was hospitalized for several months after his rescue and blamed himself for the loss of the two bombers and their passengers. He noted in his diary, Although death is an everyday occurrence in war, I feel that I am to be blamed for this incident. He repeated over and over that it was all his fault. His brother officers feared he might commit self-termination. According to a Japanese history of this time period, Ugaki, Yamamoto's chief of staff, had wanted to visit the Shortland area for some time, to heighten the morale of the first-line officers and men, and then to fly to the 17th Army headquarters in Bougainville to thank them for their services rendered by the Army since the Guadalcanal operation. Although necessitated by the naval operation, the Chief of Staff felt a moral responsibility for the severe battle fought by the 17th Army after the opposite side started to recoup Guadalcanal, which was occupied under the initiative of the Navy. He would personally persuade the 17th Army to evacuate if it refused. Even after the evacuation was fortunately complete, the Chief of Staff was uneasy lest the Army headquarters might take the blame in one form or another, and it was only after hearing of its safe arrival in Shortland that the Vice Admiral was relieved. Even so, the Chief of Staff still felt obliged to visit the 17th Army, as he knew the misery suffered by the Army over the past half year. On his way to the billet in the late afternoon of the 4th of April, Admiral Yamamoto told the Chief of Staff, who shared the car with him, that he would go to Shortland too. The Commander-in-Chief made known his wish of visiting the first line for the first time that day. The Commander-in-Chief later asked his staff to make a concrete plan of visiting Shortland, while the Chief of Staff was being treated for dengue fever in a field hospital, hinting that he would go alone if the Chief of Staff could not go with him. Be that as it may, the Commander-in-Chief's plan of visiting the first line was finalised around the 13th of April, with details of the plan cabled to the commanders of the South East Fleet and the 8th Fleet after having been approved by the Commander-in-Chief. On August 15, 1945, the last day of World War II, Ugaki, then Commander-in-Chief of the 5th Fleet, led 11 bombers under his command on a final self-termination mission against targets on Okinawa from which he did not return. At his side, he wore a short sword that had been presented to him by Yamamoto. 
Curiously, there is no record of any attack by Japanese aircraft on that date. It was about noon on April 18th when the first news of the downing of the two bombers reached Rabaul from Buin. An official secret message was sent from Rabaul to the Navy Minister and the Chief of the Naval General Staff in Tokyo. That night, a steady stream of top naval leaders began to arrive at the Ministry. There was hope that Yamamoto had survived. In Rabaul, Yasuji Watanabe, Yamamoto's administrative chief of staff and close friend, arranged to fly to Buin, but a sudden afternoon squall delayed his departure until the next day. Arriving at Buin early the next morning, he went directly to the hospital to see Ugaki, who had suffered a compound fracture of his right arm and a severed artery. When Watanabe entered the hospital room, Ugaki burst into tears and pleaded for Watanabe to get to the crash site quickly because their chief might still be alive. Watanabe commandeered a seaplane and flew over the area, which was easy to locate from the scorched trees around the wreckage. Watanabe had brought some rubber balls with him which he slit open. He inserted a message in each. This is Watanabe. Please wave your handkerchiefs. He dropped the balls in long net bags as close to the site as he could. There was no sign of life below. Watanabe ordered the pilot to land beside a waiting minesweeper that had a ground party aboard. He took command and the group went ashore near the mouth of a small river. All that day the searchers chopped their way through the jungle until Watanabe called a halt at midnight. Meanwhile, another group had set out on land from Buin and they too could not reach the spot before dark. An army road construction gang led by Sub-Lieutenant Mitsuyoshi Hamasuna was closer to the scene. They had seen the dogfight and an airplane go down. They had cheered because they thought the black smoke coming out of the jungle was from an American P-38. Hamasuna received orders by radio to form a search party and proceed to the wreckage. They set out immediately on the afternoon of April 18th, but had to give up when darkness came. The following day they tried again and found the wreckage of the lead bomber. From an extensive report filed by Hamasuna afterward, Agawa describes the scene. The wings and propellers had survived, but the massive fuselage had broken just in front of the rising sun mark, and the section extending from there to the cockpit was a burned-out hulk. Deceased bodies were lying about the wreckage. Among them was a high-ranking officer. He sat as though abstracted, still strapped into his seat amidst the trees. He had medal ribbons on his chest and wore white gloves. His left hand grasped his sword, and his right hand rested lightly on it. His head lolled forward as though he was sunk in thought, but he was no more. This officer was the only one who had been thrown out of the plane in his seat. Hamasuna realised that this was Yamamoto. He searched through the corpse's pockets and found a diary and copies of some poems. In a letter sent to Japanese historian Shingo Suzuki in 1986, Hamasuna provided a sketch of the positions of the bodies and added, I found Admiral outside fuselage sitting on the cabin seat seat's belt on, as if he's still alive. Holding sword straight between his thigh and jaw, held the hilt of the sword firmly with his head a little drooped, eyes closed. After forty years my recollections become somewhat faint, but I can say with confidence about how each body was. I always talk truth as I trust this is the way to repay the spirit of Admiral Yamamoto. What seems to have impressed itself most strongly on Hamasuna and his men, Agawa reports, was the thick wad of white toilet paper and the clean white handkerchief that emerged from Yamamoto's pockets. The rank and file at the time suffered from an extreme shortage of, among other things, toilet paper. As one of the search party said, you get to use good paper when you get to be commander-in-chief. Suzuki also reported that Hamasuna found no machine guns in or around the lead bomber's fuselage. Normally three guns were installed. Flight Petty Officer Hiroshi Hayashi, the pilot of the second bomber, told Suzuki that because his plane would be overweight on the flight to Buin, he left the extra ammunition drums at the base in Rabaul to lighten the load. Consequently, if there was any ammunition on board, there was probably only one ammunition drum for each gun. After that is used up, Hayashi said, only thing we can do is just escape. If that is true, Suzuki wrote Barber, they had only little ammunitions for their guns, and this is the reason why they could not fire against you. Kenji Yanagiya, in a 1988 interview in Tokyo, 
stated that he believed the two Betty bombers carried the standard crew which included a tail gunner and two side gunners. Hamasuna's men set up camp around the wreckage and made a temporary shelter for the eleven bodies. On April 20th, the bodies were carried out to the coast where Watanabe met the group and had Chief Medical Officer Okubo reportedly make a preliminary examination. The bodies were transported to Buin, where autopsies were performed on only five of the bodies, including Yamamoto, by Lieutenant Komdro, Gisaburo Tabuchi, Chief Medical Officer at the Buin Air Base. Presumably, the other bodies were too badly burned to be autopsied. Tabuchi's autopsy report on Yamamoto stated, Almost centre part of left shoulder blade, there was a wound the size of the tip of a little finger, the wound towards inside and up and a shot hole at left side of lower jaw, outlet of upper part of right eye, size fingerprint by thumb. After the autopsies were completed at Buin, the bodies were placed in pits and cremated at the Sasebo 6th Special Land Unit's farm outside of Buin. Yamamoto's body was cremated in a special pit, and his ashes were retrieved by Watanabe, who placed them in a wooden box lined with papaya leaves. The ashes of the others were also collected and earth mounds were erected over the pits. Two papaya trees were planted beside Yamamoto's mound. Watanabe returned to Rabaul on April 22nd with the ashes of all the men in the lead bomber. Yamamoto's death was kept a secret even from the units at Rabaul. His ashes were flown to Truk and placed aboard his flagship, the Musalu. Just as the mission was to become controversial among the American pilots, so did the time of death for Yamamoto among Japanese historians. If he survived the crash for even a few hours, the blame for not making a greater effort to get to the scene of the crash would be laid on the units at Buin. To add to the controversy, an autopsy was reportedly made by Captain Chikahiro Ninagawa, another medical officer, before Tabuchi saw the body. In a book entitled The Last Moment of Lusoroku Yamamoto by his brother Chikamasa Ninagawa, the post-mortem examination on Yamamoto indicated little bleeding, and no maggots were observed on the body when Hamasuna's party reached the crash site on the 19th. In the jungle, maggots appear and multiply rapidly after a person has suffered cuts. The average breeding time is from four to seven hours. Therefore, it is possible that Yamamoto survived the crash and was pulled or crawled from the wreckage. He then may have died the next day, April 19th. This theory was enhanced when it was found that Chief Surgeon Takata's body also had no maggots. There were marks on the ground that indicated he might have crawled a few feet on the ground toward Yamamoto. It was speculated that Takata may have placed Yamamoto still alive in the seat and then died. Takata's body was found spread eagle, face up, about 15 feet from Yamamoto. Biographer Agawa comments, based on Hamasuna's report, None of the bodies was Magotti yet but their faces were all swollen and puffy except Yamamoto's, which was relatively presentable. Odd though this may seem, it is apparently the truth. It was to give rise to all kinds of speculative legends in later days, that Yamamoto had looked as though he was still alive, that he had in fact been alive, but had committed self-termination after leaving the plane, that his eyes were wide open and staring, that he was in such and such a posture, these spread still further and took still more elaborate forms after the war. Some American writers have suggested that on the contrary, a man in a plane that had been shot down could hardly have looked so presentable, and that the Japanese had fabricated the story in order to make a god of Yamamoto. Historian Shingo Suzuki believes that if Yamamoto were alive for 24 hours after the crash, the fact was kept hidden for fear of big trouble for the Japanese Navy, Army and Air Force personnel who should have made greater efforts to get to the scene. As Suzuki states, To avoid such troubles, I think somebody asked to the inspector to make report to show Admiral died on his Betty. The first details the Japanese transmitted about the loss of the two attack bombers were contained in a highest priority confidential message from the Commandant, 6th Air Force to the Commandant, 11th Air Fleet. 1. Two Rico carrying Commander-in-Chief, Combined fleet and his party engaged in aerial combat with over 10 P-38s at about 7.40. Second plane forced down into the sea off Moila Point. Chief Staff, Chief Paymaster, both wounded, one pilot rescued. First plane in flames seemed to have plunged at a slight angle into the jungle about 11 miles west of RXP Buin. Searching underway. 2. 
Two direct escorting planes shot down six hostile planes, of which three planes was forced landing. Certain. No damage to our side. Tele. 181-109. Top secret row three code. April 18th, 1943. Yamamoto's death was officially confirmed to the Navy Ministry on April 20th. The immediate requirement for the top naval leaders was to find a replacement for Yamamoto, ADM. Minechi Koga was an obvious choice and arrived aboard the Musahi at Truk to take over his new command on April 25th. Since Yamamoto's death was still a state secret, Koga was said to be on an inspection tour. An envelope was found in Yamamoto's safe aboard the Musahi when its contents were cleaned out. It contained a poem written by Yamamoto in the Japanese poetic style, alternating five and seven syllable lines. Its message was later paraphrased as follows. Since the war began, tens of thousands of officers and men of matchless loyalty and courage have done battle at the risk of their lives and have passes away to become guardian gods of our land. Ah, how can I ever enter the imperial presence again? With what words can I possibly report to the parents and brothers of my deceased comrades? The body is frail, yet with a firm mind, with unshakable resolve, I will drive deep into the enemy's positions and let him see the blood of a Japanese man. Wait but a while, young men. One last battle, fought gallantly to the death, and I will be joining you. On May 7th, the Musahi sailed from Truk, carrying the ashes of Yamamoto and the others who had died with him. It arrived in Tokyo Bay on May 21st, its secret still kept from most of the crew. That afternoon, a Tokyo radio announcer interrupted the regular program and announced, In April this year, Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku, commander-in-chief of the combined fleet, met a gallant death on board his plane in an encounter with the enemy in the course of directing overall operations at the front line. The announcer broke down in tears and could not continue. The next day, a plain text message was sent to all units of the Japanese Navy, which said in part, The statement regarding the death in action of the Commander-in-Chief is in no way at variance with the true facts. The policy will be to issue no further statement hereafter, other than the above, since such might be of benefit to the enemy. On May 22nd, it was announced that Emperor Hirohito had promoted Yamamoto posthumously to Fleet Admiral and awarded him the Grand Order of the Chrysanthemum, comparable to the Medal of Honor awarded by the Congress of the United States to Americans for heroism above and beyond the call of duty. The Emperor also decreed that Yamamoto was to be accorded a formal state funeral, a rare tribute that had been given to only eleven others in the nation's entire history. The only other admiral ever so honored was the man Yamamoto had served under and admired most, Admiral Heihachiro Togo. Meanwhile, the news of Yamamoto's death had been conveyed officially to the family, and unofficially to his favourite geisha, Chiyoko Kawai, on May 18th. On May 23rd, Yamamoto's ashes were transferred to the destroyer Yugumo and taken to Yokosuka, and then by train to Tokyo, where members of the family, Japanese royalty and top military personnel waited. A procession then escorted the ashes to the Navy Club at Shiba, where they were placed on a Buddhist altar. A private ceremony was held there with only family and close friends in attendance. A few days later, the ashes were divided and placed in two boxes. One was to be placed in Tama Cemetery, the other taken to a Buddhist cemetery in Nagaoka, Yamamoto's hometown. It has been rumoured that ashes were placed in a third box and given secretly to Chiyoko Kawai, his mistress. This has not been substantiated. Yamamoto's state funeral was held on June 5, 1943. That morning, the ashes for the Tama interment were placed in a small coffin draped with a white cloth and placed on a black artillery caisson. The procession, led by a naval band playing Chopin's funeral march, proceeded slowly to Hibiya Park near the Imperial Palace in the centre of Tokyo. The roads were lined with mourners and an estimated three million Japanese crowded into the area near the cemetery to pay their last respects to a national hero. When the funeral was over, the small coffin was taken to Tama Cemetery and the urn was placed in a grave next to Admiral Togo, Yamamoto's hero and superior officer during his early Navy service. The other half of the ashes were taken to Nagaoka and buried near the grave of his adopted father on the grounds of a Zen temple. A stone was inscribed with his adopted name and the words, Terminated in Action in the South Pacific, April 1943. 
In December 1943, a full-length statue of Yamamoto was erected at the Kazumigora Flying School, where he had been stationed as deputy commander and learned to fly. After the Japanese surrendered in 1945, General MacArthur ordered all military statues destroyed throughout Japan. Yamamoto's statue was cut in half and dumped into a nearby lake. In 1955, a scrap dealer, searching for metal, recovered the top half of the statue and sold it to friends of Yamamoto. Funds were raised and it was placed on a stone pedestal in the middle of a small memorial park in Nagaoka. The other memorial in Tokyo was carefully polished every day for years by Yamamoto's old friend Yasuji Watanabe. Neither Lanfier nor Barber flew any more missions from Guadalcanal after April 18th. Both returned to the 339th headquarters at Noumea a few days later and were immediately given ten days rest leave. They flew to Auckland, New Zealand, with Brigadier General Dean C. Struther, operations officer for the 13 Fighter Command. The three, joined by J. Norman Lodge, senior associated press war correspondent in the theatre, played golf almost every day. To Barber's surprise, Lodge seemed to know most of the particulars about the mission and kept asking if he and Lanfier would verify certain details that he presented to them. Barber does not know where he got the basic information. It was possible that he had first heard about it on Guadalcanal or at other airbases he had visited in the South Pacific. As we played, Barber recalled, he would talk about the mission, give us some fact, then ask, is that about right? We would agree, or if he was incorrect on details, we would correct him. He knew generally about every detail of the mission. I believe that enough information was known so that any reporter could have found out the general details from anyone on Guadalcanal. Lodge would have had no problem gaining information from many sources. While on the golf course, Barber talked to Struther and Lanfier when Lodge wasn't listening and said, I've been wondering how they ever got a mission report together to send to higher headquarters. Barber said Lanfier replied, Don't worry about it, Rex. I went over to the ops tent that evening and wrote the report. I also helped write our citations for the Medal of Honor. 2. General Struther verified this statement by Lamfier in a conversation with Mitchell and Barber at a squadron reunion in Colorado Springs in 1986. Barber was stunned. He and Lamfier were good friends and had helped each other out of aerial scrapes several times in the months they had flown together. Barber knew that Lamfier was very ambitious and anxious to make a name for himself. He recalled how on Fiji in the summer of 1942, Lanfier said he had talked his way onto a B-17 bombing raid against Truk as a waste gunner. Lanfier said he shot down a zero. It was learned later that the crew of the B-17 refused to confirm this elimination. However, Lanfier claimed it as his first victory over a zero. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Vicelio, the squadron commander at the time, was furious at Lanfier for risking his life on a mission at a bomber crew position that a corporal would normally occupy. He censured Lanfier severely for risking his neck when the government had spent much time and money on his training. A couple of nights later, Tom and I were sitting in front of our quarters having a drink, Barber said. I asked him why he risked his life and his value to the Air Force for a mission like that. He laughed and said, Rex, you are here because you are patriotic. Well, I am here because I am patriotic too, but I have another reason. I want to be President of the United States, and I am going to stake my life on a war record that will allow me the opportunity to do just that. If my attempt for this record costs me my life, so be it. I looked at him and could see he was really serious. Don't laugh at me, he said. Look how many people have already done this. He cited Presidents Grant and Teddy Roosevelt as examples and said, I'm going to do the same thing later on Guadalcanal. Tom flew every mission he could. At that stage of the war, we didn't encounter many enemy aircraft so that none of us could run up a lot of aerial victories. Most of our targets were on ground support missions, bombing enemy troops dug in on Guadalcanal, freighters and supply ships, interspersed with a few reconnaissance missions. Tom flew every mission he could get on. Make no mistake, he was a good pilot. The Yamamoto mission was a must for Tom if he were to get a record that would get him national notice. Barber's suspicions about Lanfier's motivations were magnified after the revelation about writing the intelligence report, and he wondered what the report said. He never saw it until the late 1950s when many World War II records were declassified. 
If I had known then what I know now, he told the author, I would have objected strenuously, especially after Tom told me he had helped write the report. Lodge, a veteran reporter, knew a story when he had one. On May 11th, he datelined it from an advanced Pacific base and submitted it to Navy censors. If approved, it was to be sent collect to his office in San Francisco. He reported in the terse, pithy newswire style of that era. Japanese admiral who boasted he would make peace in the White House has been shot down in a bomber plane nearing Kahili. According to information believed to be correct paragraph, the magnificently executed manoeuvre took place April 18 with Captain Thomas G. Lanfear or Lieutenant Rex T. Barber Culver, or getting in the shot that sent the plane down in flames. Paragraph Lanfier, son of Colonel Thomas G. Lanfier, lists Detroit as home and barber being recommended for Congressional Medal of Honor for exploit, which one most daring raids made this war paragraph intelligence had trailed Yamamoto for five days, finally sending information two bombing planes would take off from certain field Kahili-bound stop Lanfier Barber, with escort led by Major John W. Mitchell Enid, misleft on 410-mile all-water route to point interception, which exactly at time place, we flew entire distance about 10 to 30 feet above water, unquote Lanfier said, requote Barber and myself were going in to attack while Major Mitchell others gave us protecting umbrella. Stop, we spied enemy with six zero escorts about three miles from Kahili stop immediately started getting altitude came in on them at 4,500 feet stop. We ran parallel to enemy, then swung right through to the attack. One bomber nosed down other took upward course, both in acrobatic set manoeuvres with diving turns, stop zeros, dropped belly tanks came after us. Stop I saw I could not get bomber on initial run, so turned my plane up into zeros, Stop first plane exploded, other badly hurt as I fired bursts in passing stop reaching 6,000 feet, I nosed over and caught bomber at treetop height, stop I fired long burst and wing bomber flew off, burst into flames, fell into trees, stop by now zeros were frantically chasing me, stop I had disadvantage being lower altitude so hedge hopped over trees kicking rudders slipping skidding with tracers flying all angles past my plane eye, finally outran them, but caught two 7.7 slugs in horizontal stabiliser. Stop Barber went for other bomber but overshot it on his initial dive stop, whipping back with plenty of zeros on his tail. He caught the bomber in his second run and destroyed it. Stop it too, fell in flames, stop sky now. Veritable hell of zeros which had taken off from Kahili as Barber shot bomber. It exploded right in his face and peace destroyed. Bomber flew off and went right through his left wing, knocking out the left in a cooler stop. Other chunks of plane left paint streaks all along his wing. So close was his attack driven home while slipping, sliding, attempting get away from pursuers. I flew over Kahili Airdrome at about five feet, thoroughly messing up traffic pattern stop Japanese, were scurrying about all over place as I followed others en route home. But the day was not ended for the twin fuselaged fighters en route home group spied bomber doing lazy eights near Kahili stop. Barber with zeros still pouring bullets into tail kicked over Leas rudder and went alter. The unsuspecting bomber blowing it up with one burst stop. Terrific dogfight ensued and not one of protecting escort swerved from previously arranged cover stop. It was Barber and Lanfear with two other attack planes against the world. Colonel Dean Struther Winfield Kansas Group leader of 13th explained extremely evasive tactics Lanfear Barber had used to successfully escape tactics which Japanese found not to liking for before. Clear skies ahead, three zeros were blown to bits. We have every reason believe it was Yamamoto in one of Bomber Colonel Struther said. Certainly it was some bigwig, and as we had been tracking Yamamoto right into Truk and had known where he was every minute of those five days, there is little doubt but that he was in one of the planes. Stop either Lanfear or Barber shot him down, and certainly no one of the personnel aboard either plane is alive. Struther said Lanfear Barber had been told their mission was practically sure death yet. Each of the fighter pilots expressed their willingness and eagerness to take the chance they are magnificent fellows, Struther said, and each of them is an excellent flyer. Lanfier already had seven zeros to his credit, and Barber had five, each had been decorated and redecorated for other exploits. In my opinion, both should get the Congressional Medal, and each has been recommended for it arriving back at their own station. 
Lanfier Barber found telegrams ex Nimitz awaiting them congratulations. It said, Have every reason believe one your quail was Peacock, and if it was Yamamoto who downshot, it was Peacock indeed Lodge. Halsey was furious when he read Lodge's article and immediately bottled up the story, as he noted in his memoirs. Noted for venting his wrath when aroused, he frequently embarrassed the Navy Department and the government for his off-the-cuff remarks and irascible behaviour. In short, he often raged like a bull in a china shop. After Struther, Barber and Lanfier returned to Noumea from rest leave, there was a message telling them to report to Admiral Halsey aboard his flagship anchored in the harbour. They were taken to the ship by motor launch and immediately shown to the Admiral's cabin on the main deck by a stern-faced aide, the three officers entered the cabin and stood at attention in front of Halsey's desk. They saluted and held their salutes, expecting Halsey to return them. He just stared at us, Barber recalled. He finally said, hands down, but left us at attention. I was scared to death. He kept staring at us and we didn't know what to do. Then he started in on a tirade of profanity, the like of which I had never heard before. He accused us of everything he could think of from being traitors to our country to being so stupid that we had no right to wear the American uniform. He said we were horrible examples of pilots of the Army Air Force, that we should be court-martialed, reduced to privates, and jailed for talking to Lodge about the Yamamoto mission. He raved on about security and officer responsibility about security matters. He paced back and forth while he shouted profanely, waving his fists and declaring that we were the sorriest trio of Americans he had ever seen, I knew he had been nicknamed Bull Halsey by the press, and now I understood why. He asked no questions and would not give any of us the opportunity to say a word or answer his charges. It was the worst chewing out I ever received. When Halsey's rage tapered off, he turned to a large oak table nearby and fingered through five pieces of paper on his desk. Know what these are? he asked rhetorically. These are recommendations for Mitchell, Lanfier, Barber, Holmes and Hine to get the Medal of Honour. As far as I'm concerned, none of you deserve even the air medal for what you did. You ought to face a court-martial, but because of the importance of the mission, I am reducing these citations to the Navy. Joss. With a curt wave of his hand toward the door, we all saluted, but again he did not return the courtesy. We about faced and loft. We were shocked by this encounter and really didn't know what to make of it. We had Boone tried and judged guilty. The three of us went back to our base. Shortly afterward, Lanfier and I received orders to return to the States. Lanfier was ordered to Washington, and I was sent to Westover Field, Massachusetts, as a gunnery and dive-bombing instructor. I received the Navy Cross there from some Navy captain at an award ceremony. The other four received their Navy Crosses elsewhere. All other pilots on the mission received the Distinguished Flying Cross. I have felt bad about this episode ever since. Not for myself or Lanfear because we should not have talked to Lodge at all, even though he had all or most of the information. I feel sorry for John Mitchell who did such a superb job of planning and leading the mission and had nothing to do with the Lodge episode. He should have received the Medal of Honour, just as Jimmy Doolittle did for leading his famous raid on Japan. I wish I could do something about this injustice. When Lodge's story reached Nimitz's sink pack headquarters in Hawaii from Halsey in mid-May, Intelligence officers were aghast at what Lodge had reported. The story was immediately classified top secret because of the mention of Yamamoto, and especially that intelligence had trailed Yamamoto for five days. Nimitz ordered an immediate investigation. If the capability to decode the Japanese fleet's top secret messages became known through the release of Lodge's story, the Japanese would immediately change their code drastically and it would set back communications decoding efforts many months. Information about enemy strategy, tactics and fleet movements would be denied to the serious disadvantage of all Allied forces in the Pacific. Although the loss of Yamamoto was a tremendous blow to the Japanese, the cryptographers were apprehensive from the start that the Japanese would realise their communications were insecure. W.J. Holmes, in his book Double-Edged Secrets, states that the apprehension of the cryptographers was justified because security for handling ultra-information on Guadalcanal was woefully inadequate. On May 24th, Nimitz sent a top-secret eyes-only message to Halsey. 
For Admiral Halsey, only Attention Lodge's article forwarded by your serial 00848 of the 16th of May X, secure and seal in safe all copies and notes prepared by Lodge X Syncpack, will retain two copies now in his possession, Zex Warn Lodge and all others having information this matter to maintain complete silence, see my 160039 April and my personal letter the 15th of May, Conduct immediate investigation maintaining as far as practicable personal supervision thereof. This shows widespread and flagrant disregard of security ultra information. Initiate immediate corrective measures and take disciplinary action as warranted. Submit report all action taken. The order to investigate the breach of security was forwarded from Halsey to the lower echelons of Navy and Army Air Force commands in the South Pacific. Comdior, William Redd recalled. We soon heard that Admiral King regarded this as an extremely serious breach of security and was very annoyed. In fact, we had the Inspector General of the Navy visiting our camp in short order, questioning various officers, including all of us and Admiral Mitcher himself. Of course, in our camp, the word spread like wildfire, whether from the pilots involved or how, I don't know. Everybody in the place knew about the mission in a few hours, and the effect on morale was simply miraculous. This was the first time we had any success of major proportions against an enemy force. What this did for all the poor mechanics and enlisted men who had been stranded there from various sunken ships and had not been relieved truly had to be seen to be believed. On May 30th, Admiral Mitcher reported the results of his investigation in a most secret letter to Admiral Fitch, his immediate superior. Mitchell reviewed the events of April 17th, including the briefing of Mitchell, Lanfear and his staff on the original Yamamoto itinerary message that launched the operation. No mention whatsoever was made of the source of information contained in the dispatch, Mitchell wrote. However, he acknowledged that Yamamoto's name had been mentioned during Mitchell's briefing of his pilots. After the mission, Mitchell reported, The officers returning were briefed in a routine manner with only Lieutenant Colonel E.L. Pugh, USMC, Lieutenant Colonel H. Vicellio, Army Air Forces Major J. P. Condon, USMC, and Captain W. Morrison, Army Air Forces, a United States Army Forces in the South Pacific Area representative present. According to Captain Morrison, the only reference made concerning the enemy naval officer concerned was a remark believed to have come from Captain Lanfier that that idiot won't dictate any peace terms in the White House. Mitcher then assured his superiors that the action report treated the strike as a routine fighter sweep. He added, No evidence has been unearthed which would indicate that any information concerning this strike was passed to newspapermen directly or indirectly. It is interesting to note that of all the 15 surviving pilots on the mission, the only one who ever said he was debriefed by anyone was Lanfear. He said later that he had reported his actions on the mission to Vicellio, McGuigan, Morrison, Pugh and Condon. None of the other pilots, including Mitchell, Barber or Holmes, was ever asked for their input. This was confirmed in a most secret letter from Admiral Aubrey W. Fitch to Halsey. Fitch acknowledged that the action became generally known throughout the greater part of the South Pacific area. While Yamamoto's name was mentioned in the briefing of the pilots, no mention was made of the source of the information. In view of the stake of this mission, it is considered that mentioning of this name to the participants of the strike was to ensure its fulfilment. He explained further, the leakage of information to other military personnel was due to the over-exuberance and abandonment of secrecy of the personnel who participated in this flight due to their intoxication with its apparent huge success. This is considered normal reaction coupled with any outstanding achievement and in the major theatre of operations where personnel are relatively isolated, it is very difficult to suppress. The results of this strike were therefore generally known in military circles. Enclosure C discloses that only one member of the strike force Lanfier was interviewed. The remaining members were not available. While it is not known whether interviewing the other members of the strike force would disclose any additional specific information, it is the opinion of Commander Aircraft, South Pacific, that collectively, the pilots on this mission were indirectly responsible for the knowledge of this information being widely disseminated. Subject to the foregoing, every effort was made by persons of responsibility to withhold the military information under discussion from unauthorised personnel, and that there is no evidence brought forth to show.
that any military personnel gave direct information or notes to any members of the press or those closely associated with the press, nor knowingly discussed the action with the knowledge or expectation that it would reach the press. Colonel H.J. Mitchell, commander of the Fleet Marine Force on Guadalcanal, was required to submit a report. He said that none of his personnel knew about the strike beforehand. However, immediately after the strike, it was common gossip and common knowledge that an important mission had been successfully accomplished, and it was commonly rumoured that important Japanese personnel had been shot down. It was common gossip after the strike that the mission had been accomplished as a result of an intercepted Japanese message. He denied that any of his pilots had discussed the matter with the press, but listed the names and ranks of 76 pilots who had heard about the mission. Lieutenant General Millard F. Harmon, commanding all Air Force units in the South Pacific, reported to both Fitch and Halsey that he had called in all officers assigned to the mission who were then still available on New Caledonia. These officers were as a group and individually admonished by me for having in unauthorised manner discussed phases of this operation subsequent to its accomplishment. They were thoroughly enjoined to exercise due care in the future in regard to safeguarding military information. No inquiry was conducted by me as to the transgression of any particular individual, and they were informed that for the purpose of this talk they were all considered guilty. I subsequently had a similar talk with Brigadier General Dean C. Struther and directed him to contact all those officers remaining in the area whom I had not myself personally contacted and see that they received similar admonitions and instructions. Major General Nathan F. Twining, commander of the 13th Air Force, also had to report the results of his investigation of Army Air Force personnel still in the area who might have known of the mission and revealed it to unauthorised persons. His report was also negative. However, Colonel Vicelio stated that after landing, on return from the mission, the participants were congratulated by a large number of personnel who apparently had knowledge of the purpose of this mission. Twining added that the mission had been discussed quite openly at a subordinate base, by a large number of people, and that the action was common knowledge there. Brigadier General Dean C. Struther was also requested to make a written statement, he acknowledged that in Auckland he had met Norman Lodge, who was already in possession of the salient facts as far as I knew them, and I discussed the mission with him. Mr Lodge wanted to get the story released by Commander South Pacific Area, and I explained to him that this mission was not a story and probably would not be released for security reasons. I gave him no authority to quote any member of my command or myself, and no authority to submit the results of our discussion as an interview.